long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast yearning through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, Constant Reader Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by that creepy old man who rarely answers questions. It's old Matt. How's it going, Matt? Had none to say. <laughs> See, you, true to your name, you did not answer that question. Best not be digging into business that's no business of yours, Scott. <laughs> I gotta say, this is not how I imagined Old Dort to talk when when I read when I read his parts in the book. No, no, I'm much more. <laughs> this is much more of an asshole character that I'm that I'm playing. Yeah, I don't right know now. why. I don't know why he just decided to go down this road, but we're here now. It's unexpected. You know what they say: done bun can't be undone. That's right. Now I have to be in this persona for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> This week on the show, part three of Insomnia, titled The Crimson King, begins. We're going to be chatting about chapters 20 through 22 of Stephen King's Insomnia in this week's reading. Lois and Ralph go play hero and and use their powers for the good of uh, mankind, I guess. Yeah. Matt, what did you think of uh, this week's reading? I mean, it's pretty emotional, honestly. Very um, – things became – it's funny because part of me wanted to be like, ah, oh, it turned into an action movie. And that didn't feel right at all, honestly, because I was like, I found it extremely emotionally affecting. And when when you think action movie, you think like, oh, it's just like fun and consequence free violence. And this is like, no, this is this is kind of horrible, actually. Yeah. It's it's scary and and sad and tragic and and there there are moments of of amazingly effective heroism where you're just like cheering for Ralph and Lois, but it's not like, it's just like a fun little, um, uh, you know, escapist fantasy. It's like, Oh God, you know, this is, this is too real. You know, I, I was really, uh, I was really affected by this. this. This is the most emotional I've gotten reading pretty much anything recently. Um, interesting. So uh, it'll be fun to maybe dig into why as we get into it. Yeah, I definitely want to circle back to that when we get to the parts that made you that emotional, for sure. Um, I think that's worth that's worth talking about, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really enjoyed it as well. This is the, you know, the the book really, the last couple of weeks, it's really accelerated, right? This was a slow roll of a book that took its time to set up. And then we're really just going to be sprinting from here on out. And uh, it's been fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. While also I agree with you pretty uh pretty pretty emotionally impacting i mean between you know the the ruminating on death last week and then the the witnessing death this week it's a uh, it's a lot for sure yeah um again i kind of want to save the the digging into it for later but yeah i mean i was uh i can't remember the last reading experience i've had that made me this emotional so it's probably a dark tower book seven <laughs> probably was yeah all right, let's get right into it then. Um, let's just start with part three, The Crimson King. Matt, uh, like every other part of this book and every other part of most Stephen King books, the big section breaks are met with a quote from a song or a piece of poetry. And I, and I want to spend some time on this one. It's not it's not too long like the other two quotes in this book. This one is not too long, but this is a, a quote from the Robert Lowell poem, Walking in the Blue. Um, the quote is, we are old timers. Each of us holds a locked razor. And I think this is really interesting to me, Matt. I, I, I spent some time thinking about this, and I actually went back and read the entire Robert Lowell poem. And that poem is about um, – uh, he's it's kind of autobiographical. He's writing about his experience being locked up in a, a mental institution, and he's surrounded by old men. And he's looking in the mirror, and when he looks in the mirror, he sees not his face reflected back at him, but all the old people that have been in this hospital for years and decades looking back at him and that's when he says we are all old timers each of us holds a locked razor but that's not necessarily what i think king is going for here the thing that really jumped out to me about this is that idea of of a locked razor right mm -hmm. it, it, it's this kind of this this symbol or metaphor for impotence in a lot of ways because a razor is a powerful deadly damaging weapon um it, it is really sharp it can really hurt it can kill but a locked razor is nothing. It's useless. Mm -hmm. It's it has no function. It has no utility. It has no ability to hurt or cause damage. It is simply a, a, an unused, unaccessible tool. Yeah, right. And I think that this 
you know feeds very much into the themes throughout this story of of the the elderly feeling powerless mm-hmm. and feeling ineffective and this is certainly something that Ralph seems to struggle with continually. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's very uh very cool. It's weirdly, I don't remember this being read out loud in the audiobook. Oh, so really? Like, God, little, I hate these audiobooks. Piece. They're ruining well, everything. Well, I could be wrong. I just like <laughs> my brain has no memory of it. I, I could be wrong. Anyway, um I, I it's it's one of these things I, I love I love how King pulls these things out because like absent the the context of the poem that you just told me, um I don't know if I would have thought the same thing. Like I might have thought, like, well, it's a, it's a locked razor, but that might mean it has like the potential to be dangerous. So it's 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 almost like yeah. I mean, I, I think that, I think just the word locked really because that's what I thought originally too. And then the more I thought about it, like the more it developed to me because like a closed razor razor to me would be a tool that has the potential of danger but isn't currently dangerous. But mm-hmm. locked is specific to inaccessible, you know. And yeah. I, I think that's I think that's something really a really powerful image to me here, especially since like a razor is a tool you know used especially by men to shave hair. So it is kind of a symbol of a transition to adulthood as well. Um, uh, like to becoming a quote unquote man. Right. And I know women shave too, I'm not, but, but like in, in this, in this, this metaphor here, it is, a, it is a transition to adulthood in general. And so this is a transition kind of out of adulthood into something else, mm-hmm. something less useful um and i think that just fits so well with everything we've been talking about over the last few weeks very interesting the idea that like when you enter adulthood you're given a razor and then when you become too elderly to be trusted with a razor it's taken away again and it's it's almost like your manhood has been taken away and that's very relevant to this week's reading where ralph goes on this mental internal digression about like what it is to be a man Mm -hmm. according Mm -hmm. to his mid 20th century ethos definitely i mean like there's that story like when you're with your son and he's wanting to he's watching you shave and wanting to shave you give him a razor without any blades in it right Mm -hmm. and so we we talked about this relationship between childhood and elderly and how we treat children and elderly very similar and that's that seems like that when you're a child you get a razor without blades in it once you become an adult you get a razor blade and once you're old enough uh, someone locks that so you mm. can't access it without permission, uh, which is, yeah. I think, just perfect. It, it's always fun for me to just like find totally different interpretations, though, because I, I still like the idea that it could be interpreted as like there's a potential for violence that isn't being exercised through restraint, which I, I think your reading is probably better but the, that that was closer to my first reading no i like that i, I do I, I think there's there's definitely something there that, that this is this is an object that can wreak great havoc um but has been locked aside mm-hmm. and if you don't if you don't acknowledge it it could break out and do do lots of violence yeah yeah right yeah i like that all right let's begin the chapter proper chapter 20 begins with lois explaining what the cliffhanger from chapter 19 was in case any of the readers of this book did not know what the word kamikaze meant i like to think this was like an editor note we're like hey, steven um some people might not know what kamikaze means so you're gonna have to explain that and he's like okay fine yeah no no actual data there it just feels like that's the type of thing where it's like all right fine i have to we have to go back and explain this yeah it, it's entirely possible also just I mean, I, I think he wasn't going to miss the chance to remind everyone that like Ka and Wind and Kamikaze and Divine Wind and like all, like it's just too it's too delicious to not to not make explicit. Sure, sure. Like, I'm like a hundred percent sure that he made the connection between Ka Mikaze and Divine Wind and Ka and and all these things being related and this being a perfect little dark tower thing that he could do that would be so fun. Yeah. And it's not the only time he has fun with those kind of cheeky references this week. Um, so mm-hmm. I think you're, you're definitely onto something here. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I really like about it though, is at the end of last week's reading, Ralph was like looking at the, what, at the, what was written down, what trigger had written down and she reads it and says, what is it? What is it, Ralph? What does it mean? What does it mean? And then at the beginning of this week's reading she just she just says it means that means suicide pilot right that's what it means she she figures it out herself and Mm -hmm. this is one of those moments where we have to remind ourselves and our protagonist 
that Lois has magical aura powers <laughs> that mm-hmm. she can read auras and like know everything that a person is thinking or that has happened. Like she has this ability and yet Ralph like never seems to acknowledge this. Like th- this kind of goes back to what we were talking about last week with this idea that no one has been honest with her about the danger she's in and like assuming that she's just blissfully unaware of it. But like she has the ability to read your aura and it's just like Ralph like stop treating Lois like she's not competent. Yeah, the fact that Ralph admires Lois but doesn't really trust her or have much faith in her competency, uh, I think, is a major shoe that's waiting to heavily drop narratively. Uh, pro- probably doing a lot of damage when it does so, because not you know not only does she have powers, but like hers may be even stronger than Ralph's, as we will see later today. And, and she has her own personal characteristics and strengths that Ralph seems ignorant of yeah yeah i wonder if this goes back to just like you know in a few minutes we're going to talk about like what what a man is to ralph and i wonder if this just goes back to his upbringing of what a woman is and he he struggles to see lois as a person that can you know have this level of competency that that can accomplish these things on her own really without his help without his assistance that she just does things and knows things and understands things and works through things and is you know, really in a different story is the protagonist of this book. Yeah, I mean, he's continually thinking like, I'm I'm the one who has to solve this. I'm the one who has to handle all of this and not not really, again, not trusting her, not giving her all the information that he has, which is purely limiting to, mm-hmm. to the, their chances of success. Yeah. He also just seems like a man that's just not super observant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we talked about this before, but, but Lois in, in this moment kind of admits to ralph they're talking about like what are we going to do or what are people going to assume about where we've both gone we've been gone for four days where are people going to assume we've been and she talks oh they'll probably thought we just ran off together because everyone knows i've had a crush on you forever ralph even carolyn knew about it and it's just another moment that makes you wonder just how aware ralph was in his everyday life of the things that were happening around him before carolyn's death clock started ticking loud enough for him to hear it you know i mean like this 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 idea of we've talked again and again about how it just doesn't seem like ralph thinks about or talks about or imagines what his life was like before the start of this book very often mm-hmm. and it just seems like he seemed like i loved last week uh, i forget which of the little ball doctors it was but they said you know you were a man just going through according to the purpose right you were just you were just kind of on your preset path on your moving sidewalk just abiding by the purpose that was set for you and that just feels like a a guy that was just kind of going through the motions of life and it really wasn't until his wife started dying that like he was swept up i mean literally swept up into a story but also just swept up into a life where you want to consider these things and think about these things and ponder the greater questions and and have an awareness beyond just going through day to day yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, I think he's a character whose strengths lie in his courage and and his willingness to do the right thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I do think it's safe to say that he's probably not very perceptive. I, I had the thought that maybe you know he's the warrior and she's the thinker in this duo. <laughs> that's a deep cut reference to that ninety percent of the people on this show won't get, and I'm not going to explain it. Ten percent will. <laughs> Um, it's true. One of the things I really like about what you just said is that Ralph is a, a man with courage and, and willingness to do the right thing. And and I think you're totally right there. I just think in normal, everyday, you know, moving sidewalk life that we were just talking about, how often do people get opportunities to do that, right? Like how often are people's morality and courage and willingness to do the right thing tested in these kind of big stakes scenarios? I just don't think you know, your average everyday, like middle class white dude in America is is challenged on their morality very often. And yeah. so like this is a thing that I think is absolutely true about Ralph, but just hasn't he just hasn't had the opportunity to show it a lot in his life. Yeah, right. He's just kind of kept his head down and not not made not made waves. He's a very normal life. And, mm-hmm. you know, we but, you know, early in the story, we saw when he intervened to, to kind of help Helen and then to go you know, basically storm over to Ed's house and, you know, what was his plan exactly, right? Like, like even at yeah. the time, that really did seem like a Ralph rushes in sort of somewhat boneheaded move because, like, nothing good was going to come out of that interaction no matter what. 
um, but it was brave. Like say nothing else about it. it. It was brave. It was fearless. It was it was bold. Um, and these are maybe the qualities that explain why he was chosen specifically to be, you know, uh, a servant of the white. We're still not entirely sure why Lois was, though. Yeah, that's still definitely still a mystery for us. Um, I mean, she she certainly shows her quality this week. That's for sure. Yeah, right. That's I don't mean to say that, like, she hasn't performed adequately. It's just like, well, what is her like real, real specific special quality? And maybe it just is like, yeah, I mean, she's like him. She's she's willing to go into a burning house to save children. Uh, also, just a small note here before we move on. While they're talking about what their friends assumptions are going to be about where they've been, uh, I think it's Lois who says they're going to assume that we both went on French leave, which is not specifically a dark tower reference but it is also specifically what jake says when he plays hooky from school and this is one of those things that when you start reading a lot of stephen king you just start to notice that he uses the same kind of uh old expressions over and over again that like really just are not like a person growing up in the time we did like i just haven't like Fre french leave i know is a is a term but it's not a term i've i in my life had heard outside of reading stephen king like that's the first time i heard the term used in kind of casual conversation was reading this, these books yeah king is a fantastic repository of all these old aphorisms <laughs> yeah I, yeah i wonder if it's because he reads so much and i think so or, or or like if Maine is just this place where it's just everybody, everybody's talking this way all the time. Um, yeah, I think maybe a little, a little of both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I lean toward the former because we do know that he just reads uh, very voraciously. Sure, sure. I, I, it's funny. I was reading a Stephen King short story this past weekend called 1922. And there's in, in that that book someone said the phrase what's done is done and can't be undone and i'm like damn it steven <laughs> it's not the same as the expression in here but but come on come on yeah that's fun yeah so ralph and lois head into a diner to get some grub because they haven't they haven't eaten in four days matt it's been it's been four days mm -hmm. that they, how how does that work scientifically like obviously they were in an accelerated time thing but they're also super hungry so like like where the where'd the calories come from? Yeah, I mean, I think their bodies were just kind of like turned into energy. Sure, it's like in Star Trek when you get beamed up and you're like in the transporter buffer. So they were just in the transporter buffer for four days. They were in the transporter buffer for four days. If yeah. someone was stuck in the transporter buffer for four days, would they come out hungry? No, they wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's it's you, you get the sense that there's like a kind of gradient between the physical world and the spiritual world, yeah. and they were farther away from the spiritual world and from, from the physical world and thus all of their you know metabolic processes were maybe still running but not may, not running as fast as they would be if they were if you had just hadn't eaten for four days i don't know man shit's magical i just yeah i, I just want to say I, I was just having fun with this i don't actually care at all <laughs> about like the, the the metaphysics of how this shit works really need to nail it down yeah oh yeah oh yeah need to write him a letter about this Here's a fun conversation that I really like. Atropos, you mean? No. Atropos is a nasty little bugger, but otherwise I think he's not much different from Mr. C and Mr. L. Low-level help. Maybe only a step above unskilled labor in the grand scheme of things. Janitors. Well, yes, maybe, Lois agreed. Janitors and gophers. Atropos is probably the one who's done most of the actual work on Ed, and I bet a cookie it's work he loves. But I'd bet my house that his orders come from higher up. Does that sound more or less on the beam to you? <laughs> <laughs> so i mean this fits what we were talking about right on the beam is a real expression it is an expression that means does that sound correct to you does that sound you know right but come on this is king being cheeky like he he knows what he's doing here it's pretty funny i, I don't think i've ever heard the expression on the beam uh in real life or or otherwise i um, had not honestly i had to look it up okay. because i was like what <laughs> <laughs> It, it's it's real it is real if you look up on the beam it is a real expression okay but. that's great though yeah i mean I, I think you're exactly right that this is for the dark tower readers to realize that uh hey our characters are on the path of the beam and then we get this quote and i, I want to talk about this for a while because i think like if if i had to make a a, a main idea of what this week's episode is going to be it's going to be like the lowest appreciation hour right mm -hmm. um and we get this part here where the waiter is taking ralph's order and <laughs> she said like she says oh i got it hon i just wanted to see what you look like when you leave she looked at lois how about you ma'am lois smiled sweetly 
I'll have what he's having. Hun. So like the waitress says hun to Ralph like six times in, in rapid succession. And I just love this little this little beat of characterization that King gives Lois that she's aware of it and kind of like stakes her claim. Mm -hmm. And like, it's so it's, it's kind of funny because like Ralph's an old man and he's, he's less of an old man now. Right. He's, he's Mm -hmm. much younger, but he's Mm -hmm. an old man. I don't think this waitress is actually into him, but Mm -hmm. she's just kind of establishing herself. And, 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 you know, I, I just love it. I just love that King put that in. Yeah. I mean, now that we're spending more time with Lois, we're getting a better look at her personality. And let me tell you, she's very fun, actually. Uh, it, it's funny because we're seeing her through Ralph's eyes and he's besotted with her. So it's not the most objective look. Sure. But if you look at her actions, she's, you know, smart, perceptive. She's forceful. Um, I, I'd say this is a pretty, you know, aggressive move here, which as far as I can tell, Ralph doesn't even perceive like the, the context of 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 you know her uh her intent here yeah so it's i don't know she certainly doesn't comment on it if he does like internally or externally yeah. he de- it goes completely uncommented on unremarked on but yeah. I-, I just love it it's such a fun little detail i agree like you know we i think we we had a, a lot of very not nice things to say about susan in salem's lot in our last book i just don't have any of those same things to say about lois i think she's great she's yeah. wonderful Uh, You know, it it reminds me that one of the first times we saw her was when she she was being, again, perceptive, noticed that Ralph was like wandering around in the street or something. I don't remember the exact context, but it's the scene where he like drops something because he feels like he's going to faint or something. And then she goes and picks it up and she's like, you you were going to litter. And it's like, that's two things. That's her being perceptive. And that's her just like fixing a minor wrong in the world that she saw and not letting it, you know, just kind of lapse. Yeah. Um, and that taught it, you know, th- that was that was our introduction to her as far as I recall. So, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, no, that's that's a great point. She's great. She's a great character. She is. Uh, so the conversation the two of them are having here here kind of echoes the conversation that you and I had last week where Ralph and Lois talk about how the boys upstairs probably don't actually give a shit about 2000 people dying like they they just like practically disasters happen all the time with Mm -hmm. more people losing their lives than 2000 people and and nobody nobody in the the higher levels of the tower is like sending aura soldiers in to try and prevent those disasters or if they are those soldiers are doing a real real bad job so they kind of just come to the conclusion that there there's got to be something more going on here that the the doctors have kind of just avoided talking about and and based on who we know is trapped inside the burning building at the end of these this, this week's reading it seems like your prediction last week was right on the money here that that's something that it was patrick danville that they're really trying to protect i mean it seems like that is the case i i, I took this as a confirmation that this is important you know the, this these events are important purely because there are implications to the fate of the tower and that mm-hmm. is the only reason why these great powers would stir themselves yeah and it's interesting you know we we, got to talk about the obfuscation of information here like why why is the fate of the existence something that the powers that be didn't think ralph and lois would want or need to know about in, in in the motivation for doing this act you know yeah i mean it could just be that it's more complicated than i'm making it um and absolutely and, yeah. and maybe, maybe yeah, because Lotho and uh cloth though and lakeithis can't lie so if the truth were as simple as you know y- your success in this mission will literally decide the fate of the universe then they might have said that you know now that could have could have cleared things up <laughs> but um maybe it's a, a little bit more complicated than that i don't know it also might just be, hey, part of our plan is going to be that this little boy uh, is kidnapped and tortured for years and years and years and has his tongue cut out and goes through some of the worst traumatic experiences ever. But then he gets to help save the world at the end of it. So, uh-huh. and then he ka, gets, baby. And then he gets sent off with a can of beans. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, maybe they just thought that Lois and, uh, and Ralph would be like, Hey, that sounds terrible. Uh-huh. We're not going to help you make sure that happens. Wait, you say you're the good guys? What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's so much fun implication with this stuff, though. I really love it. That like it's it's we're, we're approaching this from a unique perspective, right? Because 
the people that read this when it, the book came out in 1993 did not know the things that we know about where the Dark Tower goes. They did not know about Patrick Danville. They did not know about any of this stuff. And so if we're right, the book is going to have to make it explicit at some point because he didn't write those those books yet. But it's just fun kind of looking at this from that angle, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the best parts about this conversation, in my opinion, is is the moment where they're, you know, they're talking about the why of this, the why uh, the doctors and the, the people that the doctors work for are pushing them towards doing this thing. And and Ralph realizes that he's going to try and stop Ed no matter what the the doctors and those powerful people want him to do. So as Lois points out, the real motivation for why they've recruited them shouldn't actually matter because they're going to do it no matter what. And then it gets to this, this, this long passage that I need to read because we need to talk about this. And I think it's really important. All right. Then you should let the rest of it go. She said calmly meeting his blue eyes with her dark ones. It's just taking up space inside your head, Ralph making clutter. He saw the truth of what she said, but still doubted if he could simply open his hand and let that part fly free. Maybe you had to live to be 70 before you could fully appreciate how hard it was to escape your upbringing. He was a man whose education on how to be a man had begun before Adolf Hitler's rise to power, and he was still a prisoner of a generation that had listened to H.V. Kaltenborn and the Andrews sisters on the radio, a generation of men that believed in moonlight cocktails and walking a mile for a camel. Such an upbringing almost negated such nice moral questions as who was working for the good and who was working for the bad. The important thing was to not let the bullies kick sand in your face, not to be led by the nose. Is that so? Carolyn asked, coolly amused. How fascinating. But let me be the first to let you in on a little secret, Ralph. That's crap. It was crap back before Glenn Miller disappeared over the horizon, and it's crap now. The idea that a man's got to do what a man's got to do. Now, there might be a little truth to that, even in this day and age. It's a long walk back to Eden in any case, isn't it, sweetheart? So there's a lot here. I mean, the, the middle paragraph is like 40 references to things that people reading today probably won't get. Like H.V. Uh, Kaltenborn was a talk radio host that was like huge in the, the 40s, the Andrews Sisters. Mm -hmm. um, Moonlit Cocktails is, is a reference to a song. Um, a song written by Glenn Miller. That's that's kind of why Carolyn brings up Glenn Miller. Uh, Walking a Mile for a Camel is just an old camel cigarette campaign, ad campaign, um, back in the time when we used to have cigarette ad campaigns. Yeah. it's It, it is funny how inscrutable this is to anyone... <laughs> You know, our age and younger and presumably even people older, older than us. Like I, I did look up, I looked up who Glenn Miller is because I was like, disappeared over the horizon. That sounds like an interesting story. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, he's this like best selling musician of the swing era who, who was like super, super big in the, in the thirties and forties. And then his plane somewhat uh, mysteriously disappeared in 1944 and they never found the plane. They don't know what happened really that people concocted conspiracy theories around it because uh, I don't know, people are going to do that. And, uh, you know, I think in this particular instance, it's just serving as like a reference point for, you know, the end of an era was uh, 1944, Glenn Miller, the, the war is going to end, Glenn, Mil Glenn Miller disappeared in a, in a plane. Yeah, I mean, this is also not Stephen King's generation either, right? Mm -hmm. He was born in 47, so this is kind of his parents' generation that he's referencing here. So this is not a generation that he knows personally either, but he knows it, you know, through the the elderly people that that he grew up around mm -hmm. and i mean it's really just this idea that like the most important thing was to not let the bullies kick sand in your face not to be led by the nose and that mm -hmm. goes back to what we were talking about last week that why was he so angry about feeling like he was controlled because good and bad don't enter into a conversation for ralph what it is is i don't want to be manipulated mm -hmm. i i want it like like it's the it's the good old boy freedom you know man's man like frontiersman um kind of styling that by the way was was mostly created by marketing in this time period of what a man was like like our, our image of of the old west and and what man's mans were and, and what all this stuff was is mostly a creation of marketing which is which is hilarious because he almost acknowledges that by putting a literal commercial in here like as part of his upbringing but it's just so it's so fascinating to me. Like that's this is what he's saying. Like I, it doesn't matter who's good or who's bad or who's right or who's wrong. What matters is I'm not going to let anyone treat me in a way I don't want to be treated. And who shows up to negate that? It's Carolyn. It's uh -huh. a person. She's been kind of quiet for a little bit. 
she hasn't said a lot to him. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with exactly what you said and, and how you characterize it. I do think it's worth kind of laying out in detail because it's. A, I think this is a pretty important passage in terms of his journey. Yeah. Uh, like you, like you said, he's basically rejecting this notion that you know morals are something that men shouldn't be concerned with. You know that that men men just need to be ready to to have fisticuffs when called upon. <laughs> it's like no, that morality is is actually more important than whether you are thought a fool. Um, and you know, on, on the other hand, it's it's true that sometimes a man is called upon to do hard things. And I mean, maybe the you know the thing here is like, well, a man has to be willing to look like a fool to do the hard things that are necessary, that are good. Um, that's actually, you know, that that's what goodness is. Well, I mean, I think it, like to to bring it back once again to the, the the entire the abortion debate that this book has kind of been silently having throughout it or i guess not so silently at the beginning of the book ralph's opinion on abortion was i don't have an opinion on abortion was i, I don't i it, it doesn't affect me and i don't really care about it like i have like he had some slight like misgivings with the idea based on his and his wife's ability to um to inability to to get pregnant and so he had some some emotionally charged opinions related to that but for the most part he was just like it's not my decision, like what is good and what is bad. It's like, it's not my decision to come up with the morality. Now, if someone walks up in my face and and tries to force me to something, that's when I'm going to push back. And this is a chapter and a series of chapters in which he is kind of tossing that aside. That like, he, like he's going out of his way to help people, and he's becoming a person who is dealing with those kind of qualms and issues. And it's so funny that like. While it is Carolyn who is the voice of it in his mind, right? This is just a voice that he's putting in there, right? So this is him having an internal argument with himself. He's just personifying the, I guess, I guess we could call the feminine side of himself. He's personifying as his wife. I think that's exactly right. That's 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 the role. That's the role Caroline serves is like the really the parts of himself that he is, hasn't fully kind of integrated into who he is. You could say. I, I love it. I just love this idea of like this is. He's he's a man. He's seventy years old. He's stuck in his ways, and yet through this experience, he's changing, and he's allowing himself to be changed. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's you know that's just, just good writing. Is the 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 arc of the story is influencing how the character evolves, and it's great. So Ralph notices a pro life button on the waitress's shirt, and makes the absolutely confounding choice to ask a random stranger her political opinion on something contentious. Mm -hmm. In 2021, you would never do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you would keep your head down, you would eat your food, and you would get the fuck out as quick as possible. It's so, it's so, that was like one of the most like jarring things to me that like maybe in Stephen King's mind in 1990 something, you could just strike up a casual conversation with someone on a contentious political topic. And I'd like right now, I'd just be like, <laughs> no. no, no, right. no. Just imagine if somebody like one table over did this, you'd just be like, we gotta get the fuck out of here shit's about to get real yeah i remember like i live in texas and like even a few years ago like i'd be like at coffee with my parents and we'd be talking about like whatever and it would eventually get to politics and we'd be talking about our political views which are you know different from the majority of people in texas and we, you just kind of notice when people around you are mad at you uh -huh. <laughs> are just upset with the things you're saying like they usually like for the most part they're not going to like walk up and interrupt your conversation and be like just wanted to let you know that you're totally wrong about this but like you can just kind of tell when they're like they're like eyeing you out of the corner it's so it's such a weird experience uh -huh. and i just i just don't know if that was happening in 1993 yeah that, that's that's true yeah i don't know it's definitely it's definitely interesting to uh to think about um how how different how different things are i, I feel like now Hmm, interesting. I, w I wonder if this is true. I feel like now you're actually more likely to get hassled about your beliefs in public if you're if you're loudly saying something that people disagree with. Yeah, I guess I guess that's true. That like, if if a person like if like if you, I, I hate bringing current events into it, but like if you were in a restaurant and like someone was wearing and your waitress was wearing like an anti-vax button or something, uh -huh. like I feel like people are much more likely 
to push against that or or a pro-vax button like uh-huh. a get vaccinated button someone who's anti-vax would be much more likely to go like <clears throat> excuse me did you know that you're wrong about the vaccine like yeah interesting yeah. I, I mean i mean maybe people have always been roughly the same amount of crazy and it's just <laughs> it's just our perception I, I don't know this is a fascinating conversation <laughs> the problem is i was i was eight year old eight years old in 1993 and so like these aren't things that i was experiencing so like my right. my perception of what political discourse was like was colored by the fact that i was mostly just watching ninja turtles and ghostbusters and yeah. not really paying attention to political discourse right right yeah me too um i just think it's really funny that you know the, this this woman's flair on, on her <laughs> on her on her waitress uniform is is a uh uh pro-life um button yeah and and, <laughs> and she's the type of person that's like so so ready to talk about it right like he yeah. brings it up and then she just goes on her rant like she's been like itching to talk about this all day um and and it's so funny to see her rant too because i mean you could kind of quickly see her step into just a, a bit of good old-fashioned political whataboutism where you're uh-huh. like oh well you think this is wrong well what about you this other thing right <laughs> you you don't support the death penalty so what about that and it's just like are we even i mean that's i think one of the other big themes of this week's reading to me is are we even talking about abortion anymore because like all the bit all the violence that goes down at uh at high ridge at the end of this week's reading has nothing to do with abortion at all yeah at all nothing right it's it's like this it's it's just uh the this the football team metaphor that i think has been made elsewhere in the story where it's like you just want to be on the winning team um and and you're right i mean we've had several characters now who have pontificated at length about their opinions about you know the politics of abortion pro or con or or even in the case of the police officer sort of like or, orthogonal to it and just being like yeah, i just wish that they would all just shut up and stop making problems for me <laughs> uh-huh. and it, it, it's like king ha- had like a, a notepad with like all of the sort of standard arguments the sort of tired political self-serving narratives that you see trotted out about everything all the time. And he was just like, I'm just going to make sure that I include one character to espouse each of these throughout the course of the book. Um, And then of course, when he asks if she wants to see Susan day hurt, she says, no, no. Well, (laughs) kind (laughs) of, she wouldn't, she wouldn't hurt her and she wouldn't want um, a, a, a nut, some nut to do something to her. But if God, if God did something, well, mm-hmm. thy will be done, right? Which is just the most infuriating yeah. opinion ever. <laughs> well, what if what if God wants to employ some kind of nut? You know, it it, it is infuriating. It's kind of extremely sacrilegious too to imagine that yeah, God's yeah. power is so paltry that the only way He could accomplish His aims of stopping abortion would be killing this one specific woman. Yep. Um, and, and of course, it, we we also happen to know that it's. The Crimson King that wants <laughs> Susan Day dead, not uh, God or you know yeah. Gan or whatever. So it's, yeah. it's it's even more ironic for us. A, a character who before King really cemented who the Crimson King was, both via the story and via uh, other Dark Tower stuff, was directly compared to like Satan and the Antichrist. So right. like it's yeah, it's uh, it's I just like it's so infuriating. Like this is such. King knows what he's doing here, right? He knows exactly what he's doing to, to build these arguments that it's so easy to look at them and just be like, what the fuck are you even talking about? What are you even talking like? And that's the thing. If some like if God forbid uh, Ed Deep now succeeded in his plan and crashed a plane into um, into this the thing and killed or whatever, yeah. killed the convention center, killed all these people. This is this type of woman who would be like. Well, no, I mean, like, I'm not happy about it, but it's obviously God wanted her uh-huh. to die. And you're just like, no. <laughs> yeah. There's something <sighs> super disturbing to me about the the mentality that you, you actually see in, in real humans where, where, yeah. where it's like if some really horrible thing happens, they will be like, well, God, it, 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 this wouldn't have happened if it weren't God's will. And therefore, I'm going to make up a story that justifies this as being good actually yeah and i mean to to kind of tie it back to our main themes of purpose and random we kind of know that god or no god this is not the will of ka right this is something has gone wrong here specifically 
um, that we need to correct. So it it like it, it is almost textually not God's will. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, there's another really interesting thing that comes out of this conversation, though, that when she's describing the nuts um, that would hurt Susan Day, the people that she would not she would not like to hurt her, um, but she secretly would. Uh, she she refers to them as jokers in the pack, which is the exact image that Clotho and Lachesis um, created to kind of explain what ran what what the idea of both random and purpose existing in the same world was was this jokers in the pack now you could just say this is just like a fun callback um that has nothing to do with the rest of the story or you could go crazy like me and say that they summoned these exact images to explain this because they already knew that ralph was going to be having this conversation and they took that very image from this conversation itself that's really interesting i mean that definitely hints at a much more deterministic world than i maybe thought we had on our hands here but but it totally could be true i mean i i think i just kind of went like ah that's that's ka you know just the the sort of serendipity right it's the same it's the same yeah. serendipity as like there's always 19 clouds in the sky or whatever it's like the story just kind of contorts to make it so that these things work yeah you're right but what would the show be if if we didn't have a little fun with yeah. the absurdity of that? Got to have idea. some chocolate now and then. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, so Ralph notices that this woman clearly has a, a a sick liver, and he tries to leave her a note to go to the doctor and to stay away from the convention center tonight. Um, in order to convince th- them or convince this woman that they're for real, Lois kind of does an aura scan of her and leaves her some private information. And that private information is, we know you gave a kid up for adoption when you were a child, when you were younger. Um, so that's that should convince you that we're for real. So go to the doctor. And I mean, again, that is a that is a a, a very purposeful thing for the book to share with us, right? Yeah. Uh, also a, a mild hint that, you know, Lois's powers are are just as strong as Ralph's, if not stronger, if not that better, she could yeah. delve this kind of information out of her. And, and, you know, yet another reason why this person would have extremely complicated feelings about abortion because right, exactly. she's, yeah. I, 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 I can get that too. That, that's not one that I had thought of, but, but yeah, sure. That's, that no, I, mean, I think, I think that's exactly what it is. I mean, I think like every moment, every moment we meet someone who is making an argument for the pro-life side at some point it is revealed that they have a personal stake in this that again is only extremely tangentially related to the act of abortion itself mm-hmm. uh, and i think this is this is purposeful i think king is doing this for a reason he, he's demonstrating what the emotion behind these kind of arguments are for for your everyday normal people not for your your you know charlie pickerings that that we're going to see here yeah later but just for but just for the average person that is 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 strongly you know into their convictions when it comes to this thing there's there's usually some other kind of emotional reason behind that yeah it's a raw nerve for so many people and i mean maybe i've said something like this before but you know before i started in on the path of having children i didn't appreciate the fact that like your your typical like magnitude of emotions that you have in your daily life before you have kids is like half of the of the of the amplitude of 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 especially the period of like pregnancy and childbirth and babies and stuff it's like it's like super super intense super intense relative to anything that comes before that at least for me cuz you know i i i'm fairly you know lucky as as a person i guess um but the point is just like, yeah, like like everybody who goes through that comes out of it with a little bit of trauma, you know, like, like there, there's this um, the trend of everybody recording their uh, their birth stories. I think it's a good a good trend, but I think part of it is like processing a traumatic event for a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people's childbirth event is traumatic. And that's just like one point along this, this spectrum of potentially traumatic events. Um, it's, it's, it's life and death. Like it literally is life and death having, uh, 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 you know, pregnancy and childbirth and so forth. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny because there's, there's so much of the whole process and I, and I didn't realize this until I was having a kid that so much of my understanding of how every step of this process works just came from media, like mm-hmm. just came from television and movies, which, uh, spoilers for anyone out there that has, doesn't have kids. That's not. That's not how any of it works. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and I'm not even thinking of a specific movie or TV show here. 
just all of them. That's yeah. not how it works ever. No, no. And so, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a learning experience for me just in the fact that I had this image of how each step along this process was going to go. And it is not that at all, ever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is something we, we do a generally a bad job of communicating that stuff because like, I just feel like it's a thing that people just for the longest time just didn't talk about. Like you just didn't talk about childbirth and the things around childbirth. Like even like we're just kind of getting past the stigma of people never saying anything about miscarriages ever. Like it just not yeah. talking about them. And I think that's, it's hugely important to, to talk about all this stuff. And I forget what our point was with this. I forget where we went, where I, we're going, it, but just, just the idea that I, I, before I had kids specifically, I never could have even conceivably appreciated how much trauma your your average person has wrapped up in these in these questions. Yeah, um, because I I just didn't I didn't get it and I didn't have the life experience. So yeah, almost as if uh, it's so traumatic and complicated that people should just be able to make their own decisions about all of it. Almost. Not 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 that we're, not that we're coming down on one side of this argument or anything. <laughs> I don't know, man. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to chapter 21. Yeah. Uh, so at the start of this chapter, Ralph is feeling a little bit tired. And so he just, you know, sucks some energy from a couple of kids, which fortunately we have been explained uh, it is not is not harmful to them at all. But I love I love what the kids say here because they're yelling at each other. One says, God damn it, wet end. The one in the Nirvana T-shirt yelled indignantly at his friend. He was perhaps 11. What the hell's the matter with you? You ride a bike like old people fuck, which is just like there's an old guy standing right there. Old guy, right? Yeah, but yet yet more casual cruelty toward the elderly. That's that's our theme. Uh, the, the kids totally deserve to have their life force sucked away, obviously. Um, <laughs> and I just love Ralph's casual like, uh, I, I guess I guess back in my day, we didn't sound so much like shitheads. <laughs> it's like, so good. It's my favorite. It's so good. It's it's also funny that like he's not even that old anymore, but they're kids, so they still see him as as old. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then there's this quote where they're they're driving on their way to High Ridge, and Lois is just kind of looking out the window and thinking, and she says, "This, you know what I wish more than anything." He shook his head. That we could just pull over to the side of the road, stop the car, and get out and walk into the woods a little way, find a clearing, sit in the sun, and look up at the clouds. You'd say. Look at that one, Lois. It looks like a horse. And I'd say, look over there, Ralph. It's a man with a broom. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Yeah, it's really sweet. I think my first thought was that um, they're both dead. God, you're so you're so traumatized by, by books. But, yeah. I mean, you have your characters fantasizing about a time when they can just, just have, a, have a nice, pleasant, relaxing time together after the story is over. That just means they're going to die and, and <laughs> never reach that point. I think it does kind of do a good job of reinforcing that everything that they're doing right now, they don't need to do. Mm -hmm. They they don't have to do. They're doing it by choice. And, and in a lot of ways, they don't want to do it. Like they would love, you know, these two people found each other because of this experience and they've they've fallen in love or, or are on the cusp of falling in love. And they just wouldn't it be nice if they could just like hang out with each other and not have to, you know, rush together into a burning house try to karate chop a crazy guy and and break a lock open just to save a, a gaggle of traumatized women and children like wouldn't that be nice if they didn't have to do that stuff but no that's not uh that's not their their ka yeah i almost wonder if some of this isn't part of the reason why i found the the, the you know the subsequent scene to be so affecting is like the emphasis on the fact that like this is as if like the the old the old woman and and man in the prologue to the film up were you know enlisted to go save some people from a burning house like they don't deserve to be put in this situation they're just yeah. a couple of innocents like these aren't gunslingers you know that i mean they're they're standing up when they're called upon to but they're but they're not suited for it you know they're 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 innocent bystanders who are going above and beyond the call to save these people, putting themselves at risk. And part of that, I think, I think this emphasizes that it's the idea that they're just like, man, I would really rather not be doing this actually. Yeah. And they don't even really fully understand the, the shit they're about to walk into. It's just this, this thing is hovering over them and, and they just, they just kind of wish they wish they could, they could, this cup could be taken away from them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. uh, it, it, 
no, they're they're going to keep going forward. Yeah, I, I think it's wonderful, and uh, I, I do I do think that plays into the emotionality of of this big action sequence we're about to get to. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that action sequence, suddenly they see police cars roar past them and they look out and see a death bag up ahead hovering over something that they assume is high ridge. We'll learn later. It's not it's not actually a death bag, Matt. It's just smoke. <laughs> they're just they're, they're got so many so many. They're flitting in and out of existences that they can't even tell the difference anymore. Mm-hmm. So they speed up to 80 miles an hour, uh, which scares the shit out of Ralph. And we get this part. Go on, she flapped an impatient hand at the road ahead, and in that moment she looked so eerily like Carolyn that Ralph almost felt he was seeing a ghost. He wondered what Carol, who had nearly made a career out of telling him to go faster during the last five years of her life, would have made of this little spin in the country. Never mind me, just watch the road. (laughs) So what do you think about this, Matt? Now, I don't want to jump to conclusions here, but is it possible, do you think, that Ralph might be an extremely fucking frustrating driver? (laughs) So the first time we we heard, learned about Carolyn's side seat driving, we were like, ah, oh, Carolyn sounds not so great. But now what you're saying now is <laughs> maybe it was all justified and Ralph just needs to fucking drive the car. Yeah, maybe anyone in the passenger seat would be like, um, the uh the speed limits uh speed limits 45, Ralph. <laughs> Ralph. <laughs> you know? I mean, to be fair to Ralph, they're on like side roads. Uh-huh winding side roads going 80 miles an hour so like i don't know i think anyone would be like a little nervous and it's very easy to tell someone to go faster when you're not the one in charge of the big metal vehicle that could kill you both sure yes i mean to be fair to ralph (laughs) absolutely and and he knows that his car is probably about to explode which indeed it does so yeah i mean that that's actually something I, i kind of I haven't been pointing that out as the book's been pointing it out, but over the past few chapters, we've just had this kind of recurring beat of Ralph hearing something in his car and going, Oh, yeah, that doesn't <laughs> sound good. Yeah. And finally, finally it, it, it dies. And, and I think this is a really interesting moment because we have, we have this line here. He steered the olds toward the soft shoulder. And when the edge gave way beneath the right side wheels and the car canted into the ditch, Ralph had a strong, clear premonition that he had just completed his last tour of duty as a motor vehicle operator. This idea was accompanied by absolutely no regret at all. Ralph doesn't like driving. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's, he seems, um, I mean, I, I think that plays into the idea that he's probably not very good at it either because he's probably extremely cautious um, to, to the point of being frustrating to anyone driving in the passenger seat. Yeah, but this is, that the thing that really jumped out to me here when I read this is like, Ralph has a str- st- strong, clear premonition that he had completed his last tour of duty as a motor vehicle operator. And this feels like something that's unique to old age, you know, like this feeling that the thing I just did will be the last time I do that thing. And as like a 30 something, we don't have too many of those moments, right? We have like, like the big moments, right? Like this is my last day of college or, or this is the last time I'm going to be in the hospital to meet my new kid. Like these, these big, like life changing moments are ones that like at any age, a person could be like, wow, this is the last time I'm going to do this. But like things like driving a car, mundane things that most people do every day. Mm -hmm. Most people are not like aware this is going to be the last time I do that thing. But as you get older, th- there must be some sort of awareness of like, this is the last time I'm going to be able to run a mile or this is the last time I'm going to be able to <laughs> climb that hill or like this is the last time I'm going to, you know, just like these, like you start getting to a point in your life where, where the ends of things start piling up. And I don't know, that's, that's just really, that's really what I was feeling when I read this, this passage. Yeah, it's very heavy. Um, the, the last time I'll do that is always, you know, very, very big, Heavy moment. This is the last time we'll record uh, part eight of Insomnia. That's that's true. I mean, I guess technically, like your life is filled with lasts, but you're just never aware of them. Yes, as they're happening. It's the being aware of it, and like you said, something where you've you've done it sort of thoughtlessly your whole life, and it's just been the fabric of your life, and now suddenly it's like you're aware that you're not going to do that again, mm-hmm. and that's. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt that way, honestly, every time I, I leave a, a house or apartment that I lived in, where it's like the last time, I, I, I'm a huge sentimental softy in a lot of ways, honestly. <laughs> and like, it's really hard for me to like leave the apartment or the house for the last time. Like the last house that I moved out of, 
it was the house where like I had, you know, we had the, the, the kids I had so many like kids first, you know, memories, first steps and stuff. And I was like, I'm never going to be in this house again. I'm never going to like see that spot right there that, that always reminds me of that thing that happened. Um, and I always find that super emotional. So yeah, sure. I, I get what you mean. Yeah. Every time I move out of a house or an apartment that I've lived in, I pretend that um, my life is a sitcom and this is the season finale as I'm moving out. <laughs> and so like my last moment in the apartment, is just like me in the empty room with the mm-hmm. camera. And I'm like, thanks. Thanks apartment. Yeah. And I put the key on the counter. And I walk out, yeah. fade to black. Yeah. Yeah. You turn the light off and the light dims more slowly than is realistic. Yeah. 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 <sighs> yeah. The funny thing is, like, I'm being serious. Like, I, I <laughs> that's actually what I do. Oh, I believe you. <laughs> now, I, now, I, now you've got me all reminiscing about old houses and apartments, and I'm totally distracted from talking about this book. We got to talk about insomnia, man. They've okay. got to fight some crazy people. Okay. Um, because they get to High Ridge and realize that the place is on fire Ed Deepnow's dream team of nutsos, including our old friend Charlie Pickering, have decided to attack the place. And while the house is burning with all the women and their children trapped inside, there's a shootout going on out front, which seems like the perfect job for some ent- extra dimensional old folks. Yeah. Um, I did not expect this to turn into like, you know, an action scene, uh, which it does. Uh, I like how King makes their aura powers inconsistent leading up to this, where like they they lose the power and they get it back, you know? So you're, you're not sure if they're going to have their full aura juice ready for this fight. Yeah, that, that's true. Like the, you would think by now they've gotten like a handle on controlling this thing, but no, there's still like some fading in and out that happens. And it still doesn't seem to be correlated to anything that I can figure out that would sure. allow them to get a better handle on it. Sure. So we witness Chris Nell, one of the cops who helped arrest Deep Now, gunned down by Charlie Pickering. Uh, in this moment, his aura shifts suddenly to death black the moments before he shot, which to circle back around to your question from last week, it's obvious that like the little bald men are not showing up and snipping everyone's life cord, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's no there's no little bald man that shows up here and just goes, gotcha. Like Atropos isn't here cutting this guy's cord right before he dies so it, it's interesting you don't know if you should make something of it or you, if you should just kind of go on with what we said last week where it was just like they're they're like a metaphor you know mm-hmm. like like they're mm-hmm. not really literally flying around and doing this to everyone who who dies it's like their their presence it's like their function in this world is that and they can manifest and do it physically but they don't actually have to you know uh, that's one interpretation anyway yeah they are just meant to be a personification of what purposeful death and or random death looks like yes. which actually makes you appreciate atropos's characterization even more because like if you're sitting down trying to imagine what the personality of death that senselessly kills hundreds of people for no reason like what would what would the personality of of that thing personified be like yeah. and it would be like a little fucking asshole yeah, a, thir- a 13 year old yeah <laughs> A, a, a cosmic 13 year old right yeah. it's yeah. i mean that that is funny because like i remember like the the i think people are well so i was gonna say like the, the terry good kind um death mm-hmm. he, he he makes death seem very noble like he, he he has a certain terry good kind has has a way of portraying death as like a, a noble necessity and it's like look terry there's a lot of death in this world that is not a noble necessity it just sucks and i think that you're exactly right scott that like a shitty idiot uh, manifestation of death actually just feels way more appropriate in a lot of situations. That's, I mean, like as much as I hate Atropos, like I also love him because it's just the perfect idea. It's like if you, if you were going to play the, the what if game, like that's Mm -hmm. exactly what I would imagine that this, this kind of death to look like and act like and be like, yeah. Yeah. Even, even to the point of just like, we haven't really talked about this, but like the cuss words uh, that come from a person who's like just discovered what cuss words are. Yeah. And like, if you think about Atropos or you think about Clotho and, and Lachesis who are like enjoying having human conversations, mm-hmm. you can kind of uh, like, dr- like extend that to Atropos and just see this as like human bad words. <laughs> it's right. funny. Um, Cause he's just a fucking asshole. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he's, he's a, he's a bully. He's a jackass. Yeah. 
Uh, just a minor detail, but I thought it was really interesting how the death bag indeed does appear uh, around Chris Nell before his death before the bullet has hit him uh as if to say like he's gonna die there's nothing you can do about it like maybe i'm reaching but i suspect that there was indeed nothing that could have been done after that point like no matter what ralph had done no matter what anyone else had done a bullet was gonna find him and kill him once that death bag turned black yeah it's it's that's a good point i think it's because what we understand of what clotho and lachesis do is they kind of just chill and wait around for someone's death bag to change color and that's when they show up right like Mm -hmm. that's that's what happened with um with uh jimmy v is his aura shifted to a a a a gray and then like got darker and darker and darker and then once it reached a certain color point that's when they're like okay it's his time we'll go cut his cord now with atropos it's kind of a difference where the death bag is created by the act of prematurely cutting the cord Mm -hmm. so I, i think you're right that like if this is if this is supposed to be one of those purposeful deaths then the 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 aura naturally shifting colors and getting to that death color is indicative of there's there's nothing to be done at this point or conversely you could take the interpretation that you know invisible uh uh omnipresent force of atropos cut his cord right then sure and and then the bullet you know found him in the same way that the car found the dog yeah, very possible. Yeah. Either way, really. But yeah, that that's that okay, cool. Glad we actually talked that through. Yeah. Do you think so I mean that's King chose not to show Atropos in this moment, right? Like mm-hmm. the and I think that's because it, it, it distracts and complete it would completely take over the scene if like Atropos is like off in the corner, like giggling and laughing at, at these people are dying. I think it takes away from what Charlie Pickering is doing a little bit, mm-hmm. even though even though the book makes it very clear that he's he's an agent of whatever is going on here. Yeah. But I, I just think it's an interesting choice that like I wonder if there's a version, an earlier draft of the story in which Atropos was here and they see him and he's like giggling at them and laughing at them and taunting them. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't know, but I, I just it seems like that would be an opportunity to that you would want to to pull the trigger on maybe yeah um or maybe we're saving that interaction for some later point though sure um, that would that would be the main reason i would think that we would we would not do that here so ralph and lois seeing how desperate the situation is it is decide that they have to be superheroes and head into the house i love this little beat that kind of ends the chapter here where they're walking towards the house and like two cops decide to try to charge forward and like they're launching round after round after round into the window that charlie pickering is sitting by and nothing's hitting him and ralph is just like exasperated about this like how it's not possible that nothing could be hitting him and then he kind of comes to the conclusion that well this guy has someone in his corner right with a crimson king perhaps uh someone is protecting this this guy just just like the way that uh, they're being like ushered and and not necessarily protected, but granted powers via their the guy in their corner. Yeah, I mean, it totally totally seems like um, totally seems like it's either the Crimson King or it's, it's interesting because it's like someone above the Crimson King. I'm like, I don't really know what what that would be in the Dark yeah. Tower mythos exactly, but yeah, it, it, he seems. I think we get more even more sort of confirmation of that next chapter that he's indeed being magically protected uh speaking of next chapter let's move on to it chapter 22 this chapter opens with our heroes walking right through the front door they immediately find two women dead shot in the head execution style one of them king operating in a, in a full sense of irony here was pregnant and the other is poor gretchen tilbury i think there's something so incredibly tragic about this moment and it is it is really an emotional tone setter for the rest of the chapter and mm-hmm. i'm really i'm really glad king like recognizes that this is an important moment and really goes for it here like I, this line here really spoke to me 15 years after she had narrowly escaped being killed by her abusive husband another man had put a gun to gretchen tilbury's head and blown her right out of the world like there's just something about the the, the way king turns that phrase like to, to put emphasis on the she escaped from an abusive asshole man mm-hmm. only to find herself at the end of a gun of another one. Yeah. I mean, think how different this, uh, this whole scene would play out if they found all the women safe in the basement and they saved everyone. Mm-hmm. Like you're totally right that this gives such a different emotional tenor, um, to this whole, this whole set piece here. And I think that's what gave it this sense of 
of gravitas and, and tragedy that it has like and and also ralph is not like he he's not like uh, you know ha- uh, this isn't just like an adventure for him where he's going to save these women and children. Like he's furious. He's, he's blind with rage at yeah. the fact that, that this guy has murdered these women. And, you know, also he shot that cop just a minute ago. Like, like a lot of innocent people are dying. A lot of good people are dying, not just innocent, but like actively good people who have done good in the world and are trying really hard to kind of serve, serve the the good side of, of the ledger. And um, it's, it's the, I think that's what makes it, additionally powerful is is just you know how angry he is how unfair this is yeah um and part of me just feels like yeah this is such a like believable story like this is this is such a thing that could happen you know not the magical part i mean but like the you know refuge for women taken over by gunmen who murder them you know this is what this is what is so infuriating for me about this whole thing is and 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 i agree with you you said at the beginning and and a couple times that this affected you this the scene this sequence affected you and i think part of the reason that is is because of the it's so pointless Mm -hmm. it's so unnecessary like uh, this uh, the, the choosing a pregnant woman to be one of the one that gets killed here is incredibly cruel but also perfect for what king is trying to do here this doesn't make any sense it has it has stopped making any sense a long long time ago this has nothing to do with like he's he's screaming about abortion the entire time and baby killing and he's screaming about as ralph points out he's screaming about baby killing after had just murdered a pregnant woman like that's ridiculous yeah and this this is not this place that they're staying at is not like an abortion retreat it is it is a, a a place for abused women to kind of get their shit together after making an incredibly brave choice to escape from a bad situation and kind of rebuild their lives. This has nothing to do with that. Like it could very well be that this woman that he just killed was pro life, and that's why she's pregnant, right? That like she she something happened to her and she made her her personal choice to keep the baby. Like it it's it's all pointless and mm-hmm. stupid and and there's there's not like it's just evil yeah. and and i think that's what really land like it's just there, there's like susan day isn't even here yeah right that's i think th- th- there's something particularly you know realistically awful about it right the 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 idea of just a, a totally pointless nonsense death that just didn't have to happen being front and center here i don't know why but like right now i'm thinking about like the oklahoma city bombing which is one of those things that like just makes me like kind of go crazy if i if i actually let myself think about it because it's like what like you you start out you're like like what could you possibly have had in mind that like the good consequence of this was going to be and then you blew up a bunch of kids in their daycare to like make this point like like you're, yeah. and then and then you're like, well, the, he's just deranged. Like he's he was a crazy person, and and it's like, but that's just so senseless. That's such an unsatisfying fucking answer, yeah. you know. And it, and that's exactly what it is. Like that's exactly what King's doing here. Is it's like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. That's what pisses you off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't that that, that kind of got messy there because I like I, I'm I'm trying to tap into like why we get so angry about stuff like this, and it's like, well, yeah, it's 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 ugly. It's really ugly. Mm-hmm. It is. It totally is. And like, you know, like you said, they, they they technically win the day here, right? They stop Charlie Pickering. They free all the women and children that are locked in the basement. But but it's important to understand that regardless of that, here's the consequence of this insanity right here. And yeah, it's, it's so frustrating. Yeah. Um. All right. So Ralph and Lois go after Charlie. Uh, Ralph, as you said, is is really freaking mad. They they kind of sneak up to him and then drop down to his level. And Ralph is about to take him out. And Lois refuses to let Ralph kill him. Lois kind of actually, ironically, I guess, echoes the the pro life waitress that they met earlier, who said like, "No, we can't hurt these people because we won't we won't." we won't sink down to their level she says and and lois kind of echoes that here where she says we mustn't do what they do we mustn't be what they are um which I, that was a really powerful thing for me right mm-hmm. I, I don't know i don't know how you, how you felt about that but like there's there's a part of me reading this book that i'm i'm team ralph with this i'm like no kill this asshole mm-hmm. like you you see these two these two senselessly killed women like you said that cop dead out front 
um, let's just let's just do it. Let's just kill this kill this fucking asshole. Get him out of the way. And yeah. Lois is there to kind of be the voice of reason a bit. Be like, no, we 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 have to be better. We have to be better than these people. And it's <laughs> that's hard. That's really yeah. hard. I, I think maybe that's like the the reason why Ralph and Lois have kind of been paired together in this way is like he has this righteous fury, which. It, it's it's the the problem with it though is that it's unrestrained like it leads mm-hmm. to him making mistakes like rushing over to confront ed or you know i think i totally agree with you that like you're in you're writing in ralph's head and also like you're just you're just angry you're thinking about maybe all the stuff in real life that this reminds you of and you're like yeah he'd be totally within reason to to just kill this guy right here like absolute like like it's it's even a tactically smart decision <laughs> to, yeah, to, to right. just kill him um but what lois is is wants mercy and and you know a, a kind of grace and um and she brings that and you know we, they are able to to disable him without killing him yeah and and the thing i love about this this concept of mercy and grace to echo your words it has nothing to do with him mm-hmm. it has everything to do with them it has every it, it's nothing to do with the person that did the bad things. It has to do with what kind of person do you want to be? Mm-hmm. And, and to Lois, it is most important that they be the kind of person that doesn't do this, that doesn't, that doesn't do what they do and isn't, won't be what they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I found, I found something really powerful on that. And yeah, once again, Lois MVP of episode and possibly book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. it's a good point. So despite disagreeing with Lois's assessment here, he, he does decide to spare Pickering but then we see the asshole reach for his gun again and Ralph decides to send him up, not physically, but like spiritually. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, he sends him levels and levels and levels up the tower higher than they have ever been before. And it kind of uh, it kind of shorts out his brain uh-huh. a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's ambiguous what exactly happens, but it, it feels like he exposed Pickering directly to like whatever angelic forces are operating on the higher level. And they went ahead and either gave him a little spiritual lobotomy or yeah. or maybe I mean, maybe it was literally just like he saw the like the light of of God <laughs> to, and and. And that was so powerful that it just made it impossible for him, you know, sort of just like flash purified him. And and now he's just kind of stunned. Sure, um, sure. Uh, but I, yeah, I like I just like to think of it as like scuba where uh-huh. like Ralph and Lois have over the course of months and months and months been slowly inundated to this process. And Ralph took this guy up in a matter of seconds and brain can't deal. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting idea. He's got the bends, sure. Yeah, yeah. the the head bends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the two then head down to the basement where the women and children are trapped. Uh, they appear down there, and and an, an observant little boy who happens to just be named Pat Danville sees them and uh, and calls them angels. Mm-hmm. Calls them angels. Um, so okay, we got to jump ahead a little bit here, but we need to kind of t- reckon with this because. Now we're seeing in this moment as people who have read the Dark Tower that if not for Ralph and Lois, Patrick Danville dies in this house fire, right? Like we don't know that for sure, but I think that's a logical conclusion to make, right? Yeah. Which means he's not able to get trapped in Dandelo's basement and not able to be freed by Roland and the remains of his quartet and thus isn't there to help Roland defeat the Crimson King to get him access to the tower. So it seems like you were kind of right last week, except, except... This isn't this isn't their primary objective, right? Like what they were told by Clotho and, and Lachesis to do is stop Susan Day's speech in order to stop the plane crashing into the convention center and killing 2000 people. So if this moment right here is the primary driving force of the powers that be, why did they need to stop at deep now? Yeah, I mean uh, this is an entirely separate errand. This is a side quest, so I, I am at a loss. Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't know now. You know, the, there's got to be some other thing that is some other terrible consequence. Maybe it has to do with Patrick Danville. Maybe not. I mean, maybe uh, you know his mom's going to take him to the convention center later on, and it's like, oh shit. Okay, we had to save Patrick once. Now I got to save Patrick a second time. <laughs> Um, sure. I don't know. I don't know. I like to think, and and again, I, I don't, 
I've read this book a, a couple times. I don't have a clear memory of everything that is going to happen. So I'm saying this without clear knowledge of, of how the rest of the book's going to go. But I, I, I like this as like a really sneakily manipulative thing where like we need to get them out to the to the high ground or the, the high ridge to save Patrick Danville out of the basement. That's what we need them to do. But if we just tell them to do that, they're probably not going to listen to us or take us seriously. So we understand through our, our higher level knowledge that by giving them the task of stopping the convention center bombing, it will lead invariably to them getting out there at the right time to save Patrick uh-huh. and do all this stuff. And actually we don't give a shit about the bombing itself. It was just a tool to motivate Ralph and Lois. Uh-huh. Uh, I think that's a fun little twist on it. And it, it certainly makes uh, our 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 agents of the purpose like very very like maliciously sneaky yeah very manipulative and and having like a lot more specific foreknowledge than i would have assumed that they would have um me and my kids were watching all these rube goldberg machine videos the other day and it and, <laughs> and, and it's like yeah it's like you only ever actually cared about like the second like balloon that gets popped and you didn't care about like the whole rest of the machine um, you just tricked the person into activating it so you could get the one thing you did care about. Yeah, yeah. It's it's an interesting thought. I don't know if it's going to line up with how the rest of the book goes, but just occurred to me. Yeah, sure. I, I thought that is fun. I agree. So Natalie and Helen are down in the basement. Um, which you know, I, you know, I don't know if <laughs> if you need to motivate Ralph to go save Patrick Danville, just tell tell him Natalie is in a burning basement, and I feel like he would just go. Exactly. It's it's I'm confused now, honestly. I, I thought I had it all <laughs> nailed down, but yeah, we'll see. Uh so they're they're uh extremely shocked to see Ralph. Probably maybe a little bit to do with the fact that he looks twenty years younger than he did the last time they saw him. Uh-huh. Um and also he just magically appeared in a room that they were locked in. <laughs> they haven't had time to really reason that one out. But uh we learn that the reason they're trapped down there is because the the stairs leading out to like the back entrance of the basement, one of Pickering's friend has locked that exterior door, but Lois just walks right up to that thing and just mind karate chops that lock right off. Um so they get to open the door and they get to escape the building. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. That's the, this is the main thing that she does that I'm not sure if Ralph has I mean Ralph definitely hasn't done this and and I don't know that he c- could do this. This ability to you know, he's never affected anything physical. He's only affected things that are more spiritual. I yeah, I, I do wonder if he could. I don't know. I don't know. So after shouting a warning to the cops that Pickering has been dealt with and not to open fire when they walk around the house, Ralph kind of surveys the area. First, he sees Pat Danville again, and then we get uh, this passage. The kid shot his hands up with the enthusiasm of a veteran cops and robbers player, but his shining eyes never left Ralph's face. Pink roses, Ralph thought. If I could see his aura, that's what color it would be. He wasn't sure if that was intuition or memory, but he knew it was so. So, uh, what's going on here, Matt? Well, I mean, we know roses are in his future. Um, mm-hmm. uh, not pink roses, red mm-hmm. roses. Uh, yeah, red roses. I, I do wonder, like, where King thought this was going, you know, because <laughs> I mean, this was public, like, like we've said a couple times, this is published before Wizarding Glass. Yeah. So maybe King has somewhere in his mind, like, yeah, this, this kid is going to be important to the resolution of the Dark Tower series somehow. Like, this is Stephen King sitting there writing this in the early 90s, thinking, this is going to be connected very strongly to the Dark Tower. This this character is going to be a character in the Dark Tower, um, and putting in these details. But like, I don't know beyond you know, maybe he changed his mind about also all sorts of details about how exactly Patrick Danville was going to uh, appear. You know. Yeah, I mean, if I ever got the opportunity to ask Stephen King a question, my first question would be, how much did you know about the end of your story and when? You know, like. Yeah. Like, obviously, I'm sure that the story changed a million times over the 30 years that he was writing it. But like when it comes down to the last 300 pages of The Dark Tower, how much of that was in your head at at various times throughout your life? Mm-hmm. Because I don't know. I, you're absolutely right. Like I could I could say that he just loosely knew that patrick danville something something tower like I, he it, it could just be as simple as that right at this time he's just like uh something something dark tower mm-hmm. and that's all i'm going to really worry about here yeah or he could have had you know the entire 
final moments planned already. And he, he came up with them in this very book. And then when he returned to the tower 10 years later, he just kind of inserted this character that he knew he was setting up here in the rest of his plan. Mm. I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would guess that he would actually have trouble answering that question. Um, sure, I sure. Mean, obviously, he's operating at a different level from me, but whenever I'm de- like developing a story or writing a long-term story, like, I, you don't, you don't necessarily even know that you've changed your mind. You just have like an idea, and then you see how it feels, and then before you really know it, you are now doing that instead of what you were doing before. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I think that's probably how a lot of this works. Sure. So Ralph also notices the Cadillac that Pickering and his friends came into the area in. And and Ralph realizes something when he looks at this Cadillac. And it's something that we haven't actually talked about much, but like it's been a recurring beat throughout the last couple of chapters. And I wanted to focus on it now. Ralph kind of makes the assumption that Sandra McKay, the only woman of their fucked up little group, was the one driving the car into the area. And the reason they let them in, they let this car in without a worry or another thought or really paying any attention, is because she was a woman. That they looked, they saw a woman, and they said, okay, you're safe. Um, and they let they just let them in. And this is a thought that he had at woman care as well, because that the idea that because Lois was a woman, they allowed her to like walk up to the, to the counter and get into a position where she could like grab, (laughs) grab the, the woman's arm and, and control them into getting the information they need. Like, and so in this moment, like he says, they had seen the woman and ignored the bumper stickers, which their car has a bunch of pro life bumper stickers on, on them. So I was just curious, like this is something King has brought up multiple times. So it seems like he wants to emphasize this idea of, it's not like it's not sexism. It's just like this perception, you know, this perception of teams in a way that you see a woman and you assume safe mm-hmm. that has gotten these women in trouble. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing that he's doing to Lois repeatedly, which I think is a deliberate connection. Like the, the idea that he doesn't see Lois as, you know, as as much of a threat as she could potentially be, as as powerful as she could possibly be. And, you know, I, I'm anticipating some moment in the story where Ralph is able to utilize this insight either by stopping some woman from doing something horrible or, flip side, weaponizing this by using the fact that Lois can do things that he can't do, um, which is something that's difficult for he, he, him to even conceive of because he's <laughs> uh, he, he's the man, right? Sure, um, sure. And, and that would be character growth also. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I, I, I think. I think I was in my head getting to that, getting to where you were on that. It's just I, I couldn't like. I just kept like I, the the earlier two times it happens. I just deliberately kind of didn't bring them up because I just didn't know what to do with it yet. And mm-hmm. in the back of my mind, I remembered that this beat happened as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just like, all right, let's 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 reckon with this now because Ralph keeps thinking about it and keeps yeah. talking about it. Yeah, it's a beat that's occurred several times, so it's definitely culminating toward something useful happening here i don't want to say definitely but like i guess i'd say i'll be surprised if the book just ends and it's like ralph just kind of made this observation (laughs) just you know yeah just a casual observation about how people treat people how people treat women yeah Yeah. right i mean maybe but no I, i agree it feels like something more important than that right so now that they're all safe and sound Ralph talks to Helen, urging her to call off the Susan Day speech after all this senseless, horrible violence. But here we go, Matt. One part of Ralph's mind, a deep part, now made a terrible comparison. Another part, one that loved Helen, moved to block it, but it moved too late. Her eyes looked like Charlie Pickering's eyes when Pickering had been sitting next to him in the library, and there was no reasoning with a mind that could make eyes look like that. If they stop us now, they win, she screamed. In her arms, Natalie began to cry harder. Don't you get it? Don't you fucking get it? We'll never let that happen. Never. 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 Well, Sigh. So much for calling off the speech. Yep. Um, yep. I, I mean, mean it, yeah. <laughs> it is an interesting exploration of the way people are kind of... Radicalized feels like the wrong word. But maybe not, right? Like, once again, I have to I have to say that when it comes to the the instigating incident of this whole thing, it was whether or not the abortion clinic 
in uh, which is not it's a woman's health clinic it's not just an abortion clinic but whether or not the woman's health clinic in Derry was going to be shut down due to zoning changes right mm. like that is the instigating factor of this whole thing and that is not happening we've already <laughs> we've already firmly established that that is not happening uh-huh. so the speech is it's not to say that the the contents of the speech are not important right Mm-hmm. But the 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 speech itself is pointless. Yeah, it, it's, it's not. It has no specific, tangible goal to stop or to help something. Yes, it's it's just a a a, a token, a, a gesture. Um, and you know, if if we're not allowed to do our gesture and they win and they then then their side wins they they're winning the the what the the ideological war but winning but nothing winning except nothing except it's an ideological war with no consequences apparently because they're not going to shut down the clinic right so yeah i mean you're right that this is it's very much a story about how everything rapidly becomes about like a referendum on ever everything about existence and what side you're on and it's like yeah. no 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 none of this this is just it's just it's just sports again yeah and and i i like i want to be clear that i'm not saying that like the fight for women's reproductive rights is is a waste of time like that's not what i'm saying it, or is pointless like i do think king has very specifically and intentionally set up the 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 stakes here in a way that it just doesn't seem like it matters in in this particular yeah. instance. Like he could very easily have have written a story in which the speech actually would have a real and present impact on whether or not this this clinic was going to get closed or not. Mm-hmm. But he specifically <laughs> removed that from the equation. It's no longer about the clinic. Right. It's that 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 was like the point I was trying to make last week when I said it's crazy how the day of this big speech there's no one protesting at the clinic, the mm-hmm. place actually doing the things. Cause it's not about the clinic anymore. Yeah. It's about, it's a, it's an ideological battle and yeah. there's really no winning in that kind of battle. Like you're, th- th- is Susan Day's speech going to convince anyone on the pro-life side to yeah. change their mind? No, it's not. That's exactly right. Like, like cause King also could have written a book where s- we haven't met Susan Day. So that's one thing that I'll say is maybe I could be surprised, but I, I currently feel like it's unlikely that Susan Day's speech is going to be of the persuasive variety. Mm-hmm. It's probably more going to be of the motivational firebrandy variety where it's more about galvanizing the base than yeah. it is about persuading anyone. Sure. Which is everyone's least favorite kind of politics, right? Is, <laughs> is the, the, the galvanizing the base kind of politics where it's like, you're just, you're you're not even pretending that we live in a society where the intent is to try to arrive at like what the best policy is for everyone we're we, we we've basically written off the idea that, that that persuasion or or rational debate is possible and we're just like well we're right they're wrong fuck them we're going to crush them mm-hmm. um and again i could be surprised maybe, maybe susan day is way more um you know reasonable than i'm than i'm imagining at this point sure yeah we, we just don't know um but yeah i mean like he, he's not being subtle here right like we're we're made to compare helen to charlie pickering like that's not that's not a that's not a subtle image that's a powerful choice for king to make that like oh my god she's just as radicalized as mm-hmm. as this guy who just killed a bunch of people mm-hmm. um that's terrifying yep. and yeah uh, it's uh, it, it's especially since this is the side of the debate that stephen king clearly supports right i i think like the way he depicts the arguments from the pro-life people in this book, whether you knew anything about his personal politics outside the story, it seems like that's the side he's on, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Um, again, I'm bringing in outside knowledge, so my opinion is is not unbiased, but it seems like that's the side he supports. But but it's not it's not actually about <laughs> the debate on the morality of abortion at, or, and of pro-choice. Like it's not about that. It's about what these debates do to people. Yeah, and in Helen, we've now seen what what it's done to her and what Charlie Pickering has done to her. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, right. I, I think this book is, you know, it's more about how society reacts to these things than it is about abortion specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So while they're trying to figure out what the hell they're supposed to do next, our old Dun Bun friend Dorrance Marsteller shows up. And the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what the fuck is he doing here? Uh, but we get sort of an answer to that question right away because it seems like Dor is, um, well, he's very different, Matt. He's, he's very different. We always kind of knew he was different, but now the book is really leaning into this because he seemingly like summons a trout out of a river and then is talking very knowingly to Ralph and Lois. He says, he says he, he, he hardly ever answers questions. Nope, nope. Dor continued stepping off the bake, bank and onto a wet rock. Hardly ever. Too difficult. Too many possibilities. Too many levels. Eh, Ralph? The world is full of levels, isn't it? So he's just aware uh -huh. on a level that he hasn't been the entire rest of the book. Yeah, he's this. It, it, he, it's like he's been pretending to be, you know, dumber than he is or or more out of it or maybe he actually has been and he's just kind of have had his powers off or i mean who like at this point we know like nothing we know nothing about what's going on with door at this point but they do take a look at at door's aura and we get this ralph had seen auras of many shades in the last month or so but none even remotely approached the splendid envelope that enclosed the old man don via viazzi had once described as nice as hell but really sort of a fool it was as if Dorrance's aura had been strained through a prism or a rainbow. He tossed off light in dazzling arcs, blue followed by magenta, magenta followed by red, red followed by pink, pink followed by creamy yellow white of a ripe banana. He felt Lois's hand groping for his and enfolded it. My God, Ralph, do you see? Do you see how beautiful he is? I sure do. What is he? Is he even human? I don't know. Stop it, both of you. Come back down. <laughs> And I love how Ralph describes the voice he hears in his head here as not belonging to the the nice as hell old fool, but like a serious, powerful voice, uh -huh. unlike one he's heard before. So here at the end of this week's reading, Matt, knowing that you have no idea, any guesses who or what Old Door is? Shardik. Wait, what? Shardik. The the beam guardian? No, I, I don't know. Um <laughs> Um, I don't really have any guesses. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, th this sort of thing doesn't seem to fit very well with any of my current understandings of things that exist in this universe. Sure. Sure. And, and maybe I'm missing something, but I, I can't see it. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because we have our characters point out earlier in the chapter that the little ball doctors did not mention door mm -hmm. at all, did not mention Dorrance either as, oh yeah, he's one of our agents, right? He's one of the people that we, because Dorrance directly involved himself in the happenings that were going on here, right? Mm -hmm. He he supplied Ralph with a weapon he would need to defend himself against Pickering. So mm -hmm. he has directly in, involved in, in in keeping Ralph alive. And so you have to say, well, shouldn't he be part of the same team then? Because that's why they needed him alive to do. And you just don't, you, we, I mean, I'm asking these questions knowing that we just don't have the answers to them yet, but like, it's just, it's really interesting on just like a, a theoretical level of yeah. being like, well, it, who is this guy? It, who does he work? Who, who does he work for? Yeah. It's a very cool, like Gandalf, the white moment when, when he emerges here and, and, and helps them. And you're like, you know, are you, are you old Dorrance? Oh, no, I am. I'm Dorrance the White. Um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly where we're going. It's it's uh, it's been a while since I made Lord of the Rings reference, and I'm I am sort of starting to wonder if if we can't map can't map uh, uh, Lois and and uh, and Ralph onto like oh Mary and, Mary and Pippin. Just uh, wait till you open the first line of chapter twenty three, and and Doran says, "I have come back to you now <laughs> at the, the turn, turn of, of the, the tide." tide. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but the way we leave our chapter is not just with with super aurad old door, but uh, but someone else as well, because door leads them out of the woods and back into an old old road where a car is waiting. And who should be in that car? But the man you have been suspicious about since the very beginning of the book, Matt, it's our old favorite insomniac pharmacist, Joe Weiser. He's here for some reason. And that's when the chapter ends and I've, I've cliffhangered you. I knew something was up with this guy. 
and you did it to me again. And you had to wait a whole week till you got to figure out yeah. why he's here and yeah. what's going on. Sorry about that. I'm not. No, I know you're not. No. You're I got to say it. You love you know. this. You got to go through the, the motions. Oh, you son of a bitch. Oh, man. Well, that's going to do it for the the reading this week, Matt. Um, I, I think it was a heavy one. I think we got into some heavy topics both you know, in the book and then the politics surrounding the book a little bit here. But uh, yeah. I think the book is inviting us to have these conversations. I don't think we're just like... You know, I see so many. It's funny if you look at if you look at podcast reviews right now, um, every single bad review on some of your favorite podcasts are always like, oh, they talked about politics again. And I don't come here for politics. I come here for movie uh-huh, talk. Right. Um, and it's so funny because like I just don't know how you have a conversation about this book without reckoning with the politics of the book because they're just clear it's, and present and yeah. right there it's it, it's both on the on the surface object level and on the meta level of like what the book <laughs> is talking about so yeah yeah um, i think uh, and nobody has nobody has had that reaction to us so far and, and I, I don't think so no don't anticipate that they will because i think that like you kind of know what you're getting into with this book for and, sure and, and if somebody did react that way i'd just be like well, why are you reading this book then <laughs> Like it's not it's my true. fault. I didn't yeah. write the book. <laughs> yeah. Again, anyway. this is why this is why when I, I see people talk about how Stephen King has very recently like gotten too political for them, I'm just like, 1993. Uh huh. <laughs> this book is 30 years old. Uh huh. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So yeah, but that's the end of this week's reading. Next week we're going to read the next three chapters, so it'll be chapters uh, 23 through 25. As we are, you know, rapidly approaching the end of this book, Matt, it's it's crazy. We're on page 580 out of uh, out of just just shy of 800 pages, so we're getting close. All right. Well, I'm excited crazy. to see what happens. Yeah. All right, Matt. Before we go, we have to discuss last week's question for discussing. Um, <laughs> That was a, a really roundabout way of saying that. I, I didn't know where I was going with it, and I tried to get back to it, and I, you know, I think I succeeded. Yeah, yeah, you sucked the landing on that one for sure. <laughs> Matt, what was last week's question? What's your favorite personification of death in storytelling? You know, I was worried here because we didn't get an answer that was Terry Pratchett's death until like the last minute. Uh-huh. And when I asked this question, that's the first thing that jumped into my head. Me too. I assumed that was going to be the first thing that was mentioned by everyone. Yeah. No. We even mentioned it in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. All right. So the first answer is from All84001. You might be a king or a little street sweeper, but sooner or later you'll dance with the reaper. The Duke of Spook, the Doc of Shock, the man with no tan, death himself, the Grim Reaper from Bill and Ted's bogus journey. Sure, he sucks at Battleship, and he totally fell for the your shoes, on, your shoes are untied gag and suffered a humility, humiliating and painful wedgie, but absolutely no one can deny the dude totally slaps on base. So William Sadler as death in that movie. Great, uh, great portrayal. It's very fun, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pear Jane says, yay, death. <laughs> Death's capitalized there, so Pear Jane is not celebrating the idea of death, but rather the person that is death. There you go. Just, I don't, I don't want to get you in trouble, Pear Jane. <laughs> I'm currently listening to Sandman Act 2 audiobook with my 12-year-old daughter, and so my favorite death of the moment is, of course, death. Uh, Pear Jane gives an honorable mention to Terry Pratchett's Reaper Man, but not not a, a full answer. Death is the second oldest sibling of the Endless and is a cheerful goth girl who has professional, empathetic approach to her job. She wears 1980s proto-goth all black and often wears an onk around her neck and onk makeup over one eye. Sometimes we see her with an adorable black parasol or lacy skirts, but she's always cute as a button. Nowadays, we see on her on t-shirts on Hot Topic, and I am A-OK with that. When we meet her in the sound of her wings, we get a delightful moment where she chucks a loaf of bread at her brooding brother's dream's head to shake him out of his self-pity. Moments later, he joins her on her daily rounds as she encloses humans in the beating of raven wings to ferry them to the sunless lands. One of my favorite lines in the series is hers, and I think of it every time I learn of the death of someone I know. You get what everyone else gets. You get a lifetime. I heartily recommend the audiobook, and I'm looking forward to Netflix's Sandman. Death is played by Kirby Howell Baptiste, a.k.a. Chidi's Australian Girlfriend in The Good Place, which strikes me as the perfect casting. We'll get the sunny joy, the wry intelligence, and the side-eye, and the fun. Oh, uh, I, I... God, how many have... I think I've only read the first Sandman, and it's like one of my big uh, Neil Gaiman holes. I, I Like, I love Neil Gaiman. He's one of my favorite authors, and I've just never read Sandman because I'm just bad at comic books. But... um. I really need to get around to reading these. 
Yeah, uh, I've not read uh, any of the Sandmen myself <laughs> either. Uh, um, I'm I am looking forward to the Netflix adaptation though. That might be the thing that finally gets me into the story is getting to watch uh, mm-hmm. watch Netflix's adaptation. Yeah, it's weird. I just I feel like I've never even seen it for sale, and like that's kind of a first step for me to want to buy something is to like be able to look at it and maybe page through it and see. Yeah, you know, especially with comic books, I feel like the odds of me buying a comic book increase dramatically if it's like there and then I'm able to flip through the first few pages, see if it hooks me, see if it's interesting. Sure. Well, I mean, Jane is referencing an audio book here, so I need mm-hmm. to look into how that how does that work? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Did I they just know. make a like a, a written form of it and then record? I, I'm really I, fascinated by this. I'm I am confused and fascinated as well. All right. Next, we have shortstop 88. My favorite personification of death. I could refer to Death Note, Bleach or Death Parade, all of which are <laughs> anime. Although of the three, I definitely prefer Death Parade's version. I could broaden my horizons among anime if I included <sighs> gods who either cause the death of a protagonist or meet them after they die. This would include Saga of Tanya, the evil, and Konosuba, among others. Of course. I particularly like the god of death, Thanatos, in the Heroes of Olympus series, Percy Jackson series too, but st- still he wouldn't be my favorite. Personally, I think my favorite personification of death is in The Book Thief. I read this back in middle school, and I've yet to find another character of death that has been better. From what I remember, Death looked fondly over the over the book thief and had seen her three times before her own death due to her closeness to people who were dying in Nazi Germany while she was a child and teenager. I'd love to reread his point of view again, but frankly, the story is too sad for me to want to revisit it. Have you read that book? No, I keep I, I've I think I've heard about it a few times recently. Yeah, yeah, I keep like it's definitely been on my list at, at various points, but I've never read it. But uh, 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 Shortstop says it's sad, so I'll never read it. Yeah, because you never read anything sad. It, it's it's not true, but... Um. <laughs> uh, Koalas DLP says, I missed the chance to put Hobbs from the Sandman in for the favorite Fountain of Youth plot, but this ties perfectly for favorite representation of death. Death from the Sandman. So we got another. People really love Sandman. We really got to read this, Matt. Yeah. Perky Gothgore extraordinaire, she always remains chipper and empathetic in what is debatably the worst job in existence. Though her response to Hob insisting death is a sucker's game is a series highlight. The scene that stuck with me the most was the reaping of a baby who died in their crib. They, she always, I don't know, maybe I can't read this. <laughs> yeah. She always takes the time to have a heart to heart with who she's sending off. And of course, the baby asks her for more time that a couple days can't be it. Her response, he got a lifetime, the same as everyone else. That's that's so sad. I'm gonna be honest with you. That's uh, that's bullshit. <laughs> uh, like this, oh God, this is like a pet peeve of mine. Really, is like the the the, the storytellers who try to make death okay by doing stuff where I'm just like, no, no, you're just using the manipulative tricks of your medium to make it feel okay. But it's fucking not okay, <laughs> dude. Not okay. It's a, it's a baby for a baby to die in two days. No, wrong. <sighs> sorry. I, 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 uh, not sorry incorrect i have complicated feelings about this because on the one hand i agree with you on the other like it happens like there's no stopping it whether we depict it or not there's no stopping it so we sure. might as well deal with it you can depict it but i don't like the idea i personally don't like the idea of making it seem like it's not so bad well i don't i don't like i don't know I, maybe like it's not that I, again i haven't read this so either, so, I, I, so me trying to defend yeah. it yeah i don't think it's like it's not so bad like for the people that have to deal with the fact that they just lost their baby but like for the soul that's like hey what's a, what the fuck i got a raw deal here it's like uh-huh. well yeah you you did but like you got what everyone else got like it's it, like what yeah. what can be done like the air is the air what can be done uh-huh. you know yeah i mean I mean, I, I mean, my response is, yeah, everyone else should also get more. Well, yeah. Anyway. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, yes. <laughs> yes. And we will make it perfect. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, next, Complicated9519 says, my favorite depiction of death is probably butterflies, maybe. But in an effort to drive Scott crazy, I have to use an anime trope for this. So I have an announcement to make. And the announcement is, I actually fooled you. I love anime. So yeah. you don't have to do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Scott's, uh, he's come around on it, folks. I, it's No, uh, I, I've loved it the whole time. Old yeah. Uh, Bleach. Yeah. I, I watched that. It's so good. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's so cleanly and no germs. Yeah. And, um, and that, pi- <laughs> the, the pirate one. Oh God, there's, there are so many. 
pirates. Yeah. And they stole the treasure. What do you think about Naruto, Scott? Oh, they they did the they ran and they put their arms behind them as they ran real fast. Yeah. And then they saved the world. Yeah. So as you can all see, Scott has actually become a real uh, weeb. Yeah, um, there we go. Genuine. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to do it. So from now on, you, you can just stop because I'm, I'm one of you now. Yeah. So anyway, I'm just going to continue reading this answer um, <laughs> since you now love anime. Butterflies <laughs> are a major anime trope and used as a sign of death in countless anime. The biggest one I can think of is Bleach. A story of soul reapers, butterflies are used as a sign they are near, uh, nearby to collect wayward spirits and cleanse troubled ones and even to send messages between each other. Again, they're used a lot in anime, even just in opening the opening or ending songs the show, of a show that has a lot of death. But you can bet three times out of five, uh, um, someone, if someone important or semi-important in the story dies, the main character will see a specific butterfly. Beautiful Bones is another big one. It's about some bone scientist, detective, or whatever, uh, explains that even in our skull, we have a butterfly bone or something. And when you die, it's usually broken or something. <laughs> I, uh, oh yeah okay i'm sure i'm sure we have a butterfly bone in our skull yeah yeah is yeah the anime is that the fact that like when you look down through like a cross section of the skull it kind of looks like a butterfly shape in in the sort of nasal cavity sure I think that's probably what it is yeah that's definitely what it is yeah okay um. Walking Dude 22 says, My favorite death as a character moments all come from various iterations of the Twilight Zone. In the original series, several key examples come to mind. Number one, one for the angels saw death coming for Mr. Bookman, but giving him an extension to fulfill a lifelong goal of making a miraculous sail pitch. Number two, the hitchhiker sees a woman who narrowly survives an automobile accident, repeatedly seeing a hitchhiker who is, in fact, death. Number three, Nothing in the dark involves a woman who fears death befriending a stranger who winds up being death come for her. In the 80s reboot, there was an episode where the woman set a trap for death at a funeral and one more death is seeking his next opponent, his next opponent appointment and encounters an off book off the books town where nobody has died in a hundred years. The 2000s reboot featured an episode where Jason Alexander plays death on the day he decides to kill himself. (laughs) What? (laughs) In all these episodes, Death feels like essentially the same character. He's a generally charming working dude. He leads people to the next level, but is never sinister. I like that. I really want to see Jason Alexander as Death. Yeah. It sounds like a treat, actually. Me too. Um, I'd never heard of any of this. This is super interesting. Yeah. Next answer is from Bechtold1684. Not sure if this counts, but I'm, I'll always love Gandalf's speech in Lord, uh, from Lord of the Rings films. Sir Ian McKellen in costume, Shore's score takes your breath away truly incredible yes yeah yes. an interesting interpretation of the answer i like when people think outside the box yeah i mean it's a speech about death it's yeah. it, it's uh you know I, I i know exactly what you're talking about i was going to start trying to quote it and i didn't have it quite quite nailed down so i can't quite do that yeah i was trying to think of it too i mean i know the end of it but right that's that's the um all all we can do is decide what to do with the time that is given to us or something yeah right. yeah right something kooky says my absolute favorite version of death can be summed up in one word pratchett here we go matt here we go the man was a character genius and his version of death is the only version i will allow myself to believe in <laughs> oh yeah. man i really enjoyed reaper man i really did yeah we did a book club episode episode on reaper man and that was th- that was one depiction of death that i didn't find offensive personally even my very you're, sensitive uh, standards. You're so mad. You're so mad. I'm. I'm. I'm very. You know, this is the thing. That everybody gets to have one thing about them. This is my thing. Can I? Uh-huh. I'm. Th- I'm thinking again of babies dying in cribs because this is obviously something very close to me right now. Because my son is sleeping in a crib right now. And right. while we were talking about it, I pulled up my camera thing to check if he was still breathing because I'm insane. Um, it really bothers me that we just don't know what SIDS is or uh-huh. what causes SIDS. Like we're, we're, we're brilliant people. And, and we're just like, I, I don't know. Uh-huh. We know what reduces it statistically, but like, we don't know what it is. I'm like, how, what, why not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I ever t- told you this, but like the criterion for the baby being allowed to leave the neonatal intensive care unit was 
like less than some number of bradycardia or tachycardia events per day or whatever. That's terrifying. And, and oh those mean, that means times when either they stop breathing or their heart stop beating. Yeah. And yeah. it's like less, zero would be the amount that I would prefer personally, like, like none. Um, yeah. But uh, that's, so, so we had one of those motion sensors from day one. <laughs> oh yeah, I bet, I bet. Yeah, we have, uh, I mean, we have a thing that like, it's a, he's he's still in a sleep sack and has a thing around his uh chest that the camera can like depict it's like a it's like a geo a geograph it's a geometrical monitor. it's a geometrical pattern that the mm -hmm. camera can see move detect very slight movements mm -hmm. in so it can monitor his breathing um but i mean that's it's not even really necessary anymore because he's able to turn over now so it's like mm -hmm. the, the the risk of this thing is so down but it's just like when you're being a new parent like terrified about all these things and you're like all right let me just look up what SIDS is and it's like the doctors are like um yeah we don't we don't know no it's it's, de it's death showing up at your kid's crib to shoot yeah. the shit for some yeah reason. it's it's horrible it is it's, it's I fucking it. it's i hate i hate it so much yeah me too anyway <laughs> sorry anyway. that was a complete tangent this I, this is a lot of it's a lot of tangents because we're covering a lot of emotional material in these yes. episodes. Jesus, this book. Yeah, I'm. I'm. This is gonna. This is gonna age me more than even the Dark Tower did. <laughs> um, I'm not anti-aging. I'm accelerated aging. All right, so we're in. Uh, uh, what, what are we doing? We're doing Steve L. Who says, uh, "My favorite personification of death in literature would be in Harry Potter when they tell the story of the Deathly Hallows." While death pursued the first two brothers who let their egos become their demise, death was a friend to the last brother, which was touching. It's because he probably didn't die in his crib. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I remember that story. I like that story. It's a fun... Th th that's another story that's surprisingly, you know, dark, really, by this... I mean, especially by the end. Like, yeah, I mean, death is a huge theme of Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the seventh book of that. that I don't... I read it when it mm -hmm. came out and i guess it just completely went out of my head because yeah. when i think about the events of the seventh book like the only thing i see is the movie which i've right. seen like one time so i for whatever reason i don't remember that book at all well yeah th that whole book they don't they're not even at hogwarts and and thus you're like oh i don't i just wanted to read a fun book about children having adventures at a school and this is this is depressing actually the, yeah the the transition from the boarding the magical boarding school adventure series to the dark depressing series that happens right around book four uh -huh. it's one that i just never could really jive with yeah i, I understand I, it i understand the the desire to do it but i just think it loses what made it good yeah on some level i appreciate what she's doing but i uh, liked it more before yeah yeah all right last but not least we have sigma who, you know, I haven't read this. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess uh -huh. that it's an anime. Okay. And it's actually from my absolutely favorite anime. That's right, folks. You all know it. It's Soul Eater. <laughs> <laughs> I've watched it six times this uh -huh. whole, all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's, man, he's always watching Soul Eater. It's, yeah. Every it's, day. It's kind of a problem, really. See, he eats the souls and that's how he gets his strength. Yeah, his, his powers. Mm -hmm. uh, Sigma says, so remember my Soul Eater reply from the previous week? Yes, I do. Well, Soul Eater has a personification of death, and it's the best shit ever. Some translators, including the original official translator, simply kept his Japanese name, Shinigami-sama, but the English dub of the anime and the perfect edition perfectly translates the word as Lord Death. Lord Death is the principal of Death Weapon Maester Academy. Yeah, I knew that. That's because that's what the show's about. A school that trains students to fight against people who eat human souls as a way to prevent the resurrection of a powerful being named Kishin, since the original Kishin brought insanity and madness onto the world. But Lord Death himself is a funny fucking dude. He's just this mass of black cloth with a goofy mask on him. And in the English dub, he has a goofy high pitched voice. He gets shot at one point and there all there is is a hole. No organs or anything. His body just is black mass. And you can contact Lord Death anytime by fogging up a mirror or any reflective surface, writing 42-42-564. You see, in Japanese, his phone number reads as Shini Shini Goroshi, which means death, death, murder. So that's my favorite anime, Soul Eater. 
Mm-hmm. Um, what's your favorite part of Soul Eater, Matt? My favorite part is um, one of the students at the school. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he's really into a, a classmate of his, mm-hmm. and then he gets like really excited and he falls out of his chair, and that's how excited he is about his classmate. And then yeah. um, and then he saves the world by eating a soul. Yeah, I I remember that part. It, yeah. Doesn't he get like a really uh, incredibly bad nosebleed? At that point, yeah, because- he just he can't even control it, and he has to rush into the bathroom. And while he's there, he trips over uh, Lord Death, and then Lord Death says, "How's the soul yeah. eating going? Yeah. You eating them all?" Yeah. And there's like a little cute cat creature, um, or like s- some kind of cute creature of some kind. I forget what kind exactly. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's an armadillo. Um, yeah, and it has like it's actually an interdimensional death being. Yeah, um, and it's super powerful, and it's like ten thousand years old. Yeah, and it uh, it also eats souls. Everyone in the show eats souls because that it's the Soul Eater show. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's great. Now none of you have to watch it because we've just perfectly explained Soul yeah. Eater. If any, if any of you want to, you know, option the rights to these stories that, that me and Scott are are, are crafting here. Um, well, no, because the stories, oh, Matt, right. it's already been crafted. Sorry, it's the show. Right. So, I, mean, I was just, I was just relaying what you, happens yeah, in the show Soul you know, Eater. You're just summarizing. Show, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I know, I know. Um, next week's discussion question. Has uh, this was a tough one. Nothing to do with anime. <laughs> or it does is, it? Or oh, God. Um, <laughs> the question is, what do you think about Ka? How have your feelings about Ka changed over the course of this podcast, over season two, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Can we can we be honest here for a sec? Yeah, we sat course. here for 20 minutes before we were supposed to be recording, uh, failing to come up with a question for this week yeah. um, that had to do with these these chapters. And I yeah. sat, I sat like a full day before that trying on my own to think of something. And we just couldn't think of a question. I think it's because of the nature of these chapters and the serious stuff that's going on here. Just as there wasn't room for a discussion question outside of something that is intensely personal to people right. that I don't want to ask about. Um, yeah. or, so, or, or just like a massive downer, like, you know, what's yeah. your favorite really fucking sad scene? Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. What's, what's your favorite moment of someone uh, being senselessly murdered? Right. And yeah, that's, not, that's, I would love to read those. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so so instead, we just decided to go a little more broad and talk about Ka. We haven't like got y'all's opinions on Ka in a while, if ever. And now that, you know, we're completely done with the Dark Tower and and the season two stories are, I think, kind of filling in the blanks, if it as it were, uh, around what our concept of Ka is. We're curious what you guys think of it as a, a thing that exists in all of these worlds and uh, and uh, and just a general concept. Absolutely. So please forgive us for not having a specific discussion question related to this week's chapter. Hopefully next week goes a little bit better. But uh, that's the question for this week. Please enjoy it. And we look forward to seeing y'all's responses. Yep. All right. That is going to do it for us this week. As I said earlier, next week's chapters are chapters 23 through 25 of this book. Uh, Please read them and then be ready to be back here next Thursday to chat about them with us. Yeah. Remember, you can reach out to us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at kingslingerspod. And of course, the subreddit at r slash doofmedia is a great place to answer the discussion question or just to post a cool thread about some observation you've made about the Dark Tower series, perhaps. Absolutely. If you are not already subscribed to Kingslingers, please do so now. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world, there are podcasts, which is uh, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, then please consider donating to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Special thanks this week to new patron, Trey. Uh, welcome, Trey. We hope you enjoy uh, the special bonus podcasts we have where you can listen to me and Scott talk about uh, Dark Tower adaptations and all the other cool stuff. No, I don't. I don't think Trey donated at that level, so they will not be able well, to do that. Hopefully, Trey will see those things on the Patreon <laughs> and be like, "Oh, that looks mighty tempting." But Trey will get to participate in all the contests we have um, in the voting for that. He will uh, get to help us pick um, our Council of Doof episodes each month. He'll help us vote in book club and game club and all that good stuff. There's plenty of good stuff for anyone yeah. at any level over on Patreon. There absolutely is. Yeah. 
If you cannot afford to donate, of course, that is absolutely okay. You can always help out by sharing this podcast with all your Stephen King loving friends. Um, maybe not this week's episode, though. Maybe start them with a different <laughs> episode first. Uh-huh. This is a heavy episode. Uh, or, you know, just share it randomly on social media. Again, maybe not this one. Um, and you can always help us out by leaving us a rating and a review. This week's spotlight review comes from Coralie, who gives us five stars and says, Through the Tower and Beyond. This podcast has kept me company on many long drives and during many late nights. I love how deep they go into the texts. It breathes such new life into the books I've read over and over again. I have finally caught up after starting where they when they were well on their way to Roland's final problem. I can't wait to continue reading with y'all as the books dive deeper and deeper into the other levels of the tower. Well, thank you, Coralie. That was very nice of you. Yeah, really appreciate that. All right, folks, that is it. We are finally finished. We hope you enjoy your week and we hope to see you back here next week as we continue to make our way through insomnia, long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. <laughs>